Dr. Ibram Kendi wrote this, the only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. That's right, that's what he said. Think about that for a moment. He's saying that he's opposed to equality under the law. He's opposing our merit-based system for federal employment. Now, it's a free country. Dr. Kendi and these other authors can write their books and debate their views and put them out in public. It's absolutely their right to do so. They are welcome to do so, but what we cannot allow, what we must not allow, is our federal government to affirm and sanction and advocate this critical race theory. We cannot allow the United States of America, the greatest nation on earth, to legitimize a new era of racial engineering. Young children set off to school with eyes full of hope and hearts full of pride in their country only to be taught that white privilege defines the nation, that subjects like mathematics are inherently racist, that the Christian faith is oppressive. They're taught that the nuclear family perpetuates racism. Now imagine for a moment if you were taught the same. Imagine if you were taught that your dreams were unjust or unfair, that your family were oppressors, that you were at fault for the problems of our society today. Last year, we discovered that federal agencies and other organizations funded by taxpayers were holding workplace training sessions where federal employees were told that virtually all white people contribute to racism. That's a quote. Or where civil servants were required to say that they benefit from racism. Now, President Trump put an end to this divisive curriculum, and he was right to do so. Workplace diversity training should focus on bringing people together, not on driving them apart. But under this new administration, I fear that critical theory is making a comeback. In March, President Biden rescinded the former president's ban on this divisive curriculum, and now he's nominated Kieran Ahuja to be director of the Office of Personnel Management. And just last year, Ms. Ahuja wrote that we must free the nation from the daily trials of white supremacy. Those are her words. She appeared to endorse Dr. Kendi's claim that the election of President Trump in 2016 was an example of racist progress in this country. And she declared that we must do everything in our collective power to realize Dr. Kendi's vision for America. All of my Republican colleagues on the Homeland Security Committee opposed Ms. Ahuja in a vote back in April. Two weeks ago, the Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association they represent 100,000 federal police officers that protect and defend our nation every day. They announced that they were also concerned about Ms. Ahuja's nomination because of her advocacy of critical theory. I have to say, I agree with federal law enforcement. I agree with what they said in their letter. We should nominate candidates for public office that are committed to ideological neutrality, to fairness, and to impartiality under the law. The advocates of critical theory tell us we have to dismantle our culture, our history, our families, our Jewish and Christian heritage and beliefs because they're all oppressive. They say the future of this nation will be defined by racial division and racial strife. Mr. President, I reject that prophecy of our future and I take my stand on the goodness of the American people and the God who guides us. I take my stand on hope. We're united by the radical belief that those who liberate others, those who practice grace and mercy, those who call forth the best in those around them, they're the ones who change the world. And that principle, that truth, that hope is what drives our history. And we are not done building that history yet. The greatest nation in the history of the world is not done yet. Critical theory in all of its guises distorts our history, it destroys our common loves, and it would leave us hopelessly divided at enmity with one another and alone. I'm here today to talk about those things that unite us as Americans, and I'm here to talk about those things that divide us. For centuries, public service has been something that unites Americans, drawing us together, 
Citizens from all walks of life serve in our military. They serve in federal and state and local governments. They serve in police units and in fire departments across our country. They serve as teachers and coaches. And we as a nation are better off for their service and for their sacrifice. Those who serve our nation do it not because they have to, but because they want to. They do it because they believe this nation is worth serving. They do it because they believe this nation is worth defending. They believe it is worth celebrating. And they are right to think all of those things. Service to this country is an act of selflessness that affirms our nation is a place worth believing in. But I'm concerned that the President administration and this President, President Joe Biden, do not share this point of view. I'm worried that President Biden is nominating for federal office individuals who do not share a view of America as a good and decent place, who do not believe that the history of this nation is worth celebrating, nominating instead people who believe that this is a country founded in racism and shot through with corruption. Many of these nominees are partisans of a viewpoint that goes by different names, but shares several features in common. A view that America is a systemically racist place and systemically unjust. A view of America as corrupt. A view of American society as one that needs to be deconstructed, that needs to be pulled apart, torn down, and then rebuilt in a fundamentally different way. Now this broad ideology has become known in public as critical race theory, or sometimes just critical theory. And let me tell you, as someone who has taught in our nation's university, someone who has seen our institutions of higher learning up close, I would say to those in the media and elsewhere who now deny that there is any such thing as critical theory, that critical theory is in fact very real. It is very influential. And it appears to have become the animating ideology of this administration. And that is cause for great concern. Critical theory is an ideology that says the United States is rotten to its core. The leaders of this movement think our society is defined by white supremacy. They think our leaders are complicit at best. They think that all Americans are either oppressors or oppressed. In our world-class military, these critics see a vehicle for discrimination. In our American flag, they see propaganda. In our family businesses, they see white supremacy. In our police officers, they see agents of racial oppression. These critics allow no room for merit, for experience, or for grace in our life together. They pit whiteness and blackness against each other in a manner that reduces every American, no matter their character or their creed, to their racial identity alone. One of these critics, Dr. Ibram Kendi, wrote this, the only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. That's right, that's what he said. Think about that for a moment. He's saying that he's opposed to equality under the law. He's opposing our merit-based system for federal employment. Dr. Kendi and his followers are in no uncertain terms advocating for state-sanctioned racism in the United States of America. Now, it's a free country. Dr. Kendi and these other authors can write their books and debate their views and put them out in public. It's absolutely their right to do so. They are welcome to do so, but what we cannot allow, what we must not allow, is our federal government to affirm and sanction and advocate this critical race theory. We cannot allow the United States of America, the greatest nation on earth, to legitimize a new era of racial engineering. In the past few years, critical race theory has gained new prominence in the giant corporations, in the media, in the military, even in our children's schools. We're seeing this across the country 
We've seen too many of our children exposed to a curriculum like the 1619 Project and its derivatives that encourages division rather than unity, that rewrites our history in the service of an ideological agenda rather than in the service of truth. Young children set off to school with eyes full of hope and hearts full of pride in their country only to be taught that white privilege defines the nation, that subjects like mathematics are inherently racist, that the Christian faith is oppressive. They're taught that the nuclear family perpetuates racism. Now imagine for a moment if you were taught the same. Imagine if you were taught that your dreams were unjust or unfair, that your family were oppressors, that you were at fault for the problems of our society today. These are just children. We should be nurturing their dreams. We should be nurturing their hopes. We should be giving them a great hope for the future, for the future of this great nation known as the United States of America, a hope for the future of the greatest nation in the history of the world, rather than teaching them to mistrust their classmates and to distrust their own history. It doesn't end there. Last year, we discovered that federal agencies and other organizations funded by taxpayers were holding workplace training sessions where federal employees were told that virtually all white people contribute to racism, that's a quote, or where civil servants were required to say that they benefit from racism. Now, President Trump put an end to this divisive curriculum and he was right to do so. Workplace diversity training should focus on bringing people together, not on driving them apart. But under this new administration, I fear that critical theory is making a comeback. In March, President Biden rescinded the former president's ban on this divisive curriculum, and now he's nominated Kieran Ahuja to be director of the Office of Personnel Management. That's a key position that runs human resources for the entire federal government and millions of its employees. And Ms. Ahuja's nomination is before the Senate today. I'm concerned that Ms. Ahuja is a disciple of radical, critical theorists. She has frequently promoted Dr. Kendi. She called him a thought leader at her confirmation hearing back in April. And just last year, Ms. Ahuja wrote that we must free the nation from the daily trials of white supremacy. Those are her words. She appeared to endorse Dr. Kendi's claim that the election of President Trump in 2016 was an example of racist progress in this country. And she declared that we must do everything in our collective power to realize Dr. Kendi's vision for America. Mr. President, I'm concerned that as the federal government's HR director, Ms. Ahuja could use her platform to promote radical ideologies that seek to divide rather than unite the American people. She could bring critical race theory back into federal government training, into every level of federal personnel stronger than ever. And I'm not alone in this concern. All of my Republican colleagues on the Homeland Security Committee opposed Ms. Ahuja in a vote back in April. Two weeks ago, the Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association, they represent 100,000 federal police officers that protect and defend our nation every day. They announced that they were also concerned about Ms. Ahuja's nomination because of her advocacy of critical theory. I have to say, I agree with federal law enforcement. I agree with what they said in their letter. We should nominate candidates for public office that are committed to ideological neutrality, to fairness, and to impartiality under the law. Now, I want to be clear, Mr. President, I do not for a moment question Ms. Ahuja's sincerity or her integrity. And in fact, I thank her for her willingness to serve the nation, but I cannot agree with what appears to be her fundamental ideology. At the end of the day, this is not about politics or personalities. This is about ensuring that the federal government stands for unity, not division, harmony, not hate. As the Reverend Dr. King famously said, and he was right, we should judge our fellow citizens by the content of their character not by the color of their skin. Mr. President, we need a strong nation with strong citizens who see each other as Americans, not as oppressors 
or oppressed. Now, I've heard a lot of criticism about my position here today. I've heard the corporate media and those on the left say that I misunderstand critical theory or that it's not real or that it's not a real problem. I've heard many say the United States is indeed built on oppression and remains a systematically, systemically racist place. All I can say, Mr. President, is that's not the America that I see, and that's not the America that I know. The working people of this country who have rallied to this nation's flag in every hour of danger, who are the first to help a neighbor in need, who coach our little leagues and volunteer at our churches, who go to work day in and day out to provide for their families and protect the place they call home. These are not oppressors, Mr. President. These are liberators. These are not oppressors, Mr. President. These are great people. They live with a spirit of liberty that has made this country the greatest country in the history of the world, and they want to see that liberty extended to every member of the American family. That's who the American people are. That's what makes them great. That's what they believe. And because they are a great people, Mr. President, our future is a cause for hope and not despair. The advocates of critical theory tell us we have to dismantle our culture, our history, our families, our Jewish and Christian heritage and beliefs because they're all oppressive. They say the future of this nation will be defined by racial division and racial strife. Mr. President, I reject that prophecy of our future and I take my stand on the goodness of the American people and the God who guides us. I take my stand on hope. Mr. President, it is not oppression that defines the American story. It is hope. From the Minutemen at Lexington and Concord, to the pioneers who found a new life in the West, to the heroes of the Underground Railroad, to the Union soldiers at Little Round Top, to the workers who fought the old monopolies for fair pay, to the women who won suffrage, to the young men who twice liberated Europe, to the civil rights demonstrators who faced down the likes of Bull Connor, to the firemen and police officers who rebuilt New York, and gave this country confidence again in the years after 9-11. It is love for one another and love for our country that we call home that has defined our story and given us hope. And that love and that hope will define our future once again. I am confident of it. In this nation, we're not united by ethnic creed or race or religion, and probably so. We are united by our shared history. We're united by what we love together. We're united by the radical belief that those who liberate others, those who practice grace and mercy, those who call forth the best in those around them, they're the ones who change the world. And that principle, that truth, that hope is what drives our history. And we are not done building that history yet. The greatest nation in the history of the world is not done yet. Critical theory, in all of its guises, distorts our history, it destroys our common loves, and it would leave us hopelessly divided, at enmity with one another, and alone. To this dark vision, we must say no. To radical hope, we must say yes. For these reasons, Mr. President, I urge my colleagues to vote no on Masahusha's nomination, and I yield the floor.